today we get to celebrate baptism. Amen. One of the great things we get to do, uh, obviously we know that we're saved by faith, but it's something about making that public declaration by going to the waters and being submerged just as Jesus himself was baptized. And so today we have one candidate that's going to be baptized. And so, uh, Mr. Candidate, <laughs> Kevin, will you join me here, sir? Come on now. You can sit right here. So this is Kevin. Everybody say, hey, Kevin. <laughs> y'all know Kevin. Y'all seen Kevin serving here. And Kevin's made the decision uh, to, to be baptized. And it's an amazing thing uh, that, that we get an opportunity to do. And so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to baptize my brother today. Um, one of the things I get to ask Kevin is this. Kevin, what is your profession of faith? That Jesus is Lord. He said that Jesus is Lord. Amen. And so without, with that, without any further ado, I'm going to ask you to turn this way. Put, put your feet down there so I don't drown you. Amen. <laughs> bottom step. Put them on the bottom just a little last. There you go. All right, brother. Right now, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We go down with him, and we raise up to new life in Christ. Praise God. Oh, you welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome Thank you. 
At this time, we're going to take communion together as a family. And so I'll give you a moment. If you didn't get a chance to get communion elements when you came in, they're on the back table back there. So please, ma'am, please, sir, go and grab an element if you need them. Uh, this morning, uh, I have a little something different I want to share by way of passage. I, I, I love going to 1 Corinthians 11. It's like, you know, for pastors, it's, it's to go to, right? Uh, but God gave me something different today to share with you. And so I'm going to read a, a passage. We're going to talk about it, and then we're going to take communion this morning. Uh, the passage is going to come from Acts chapter 27. For a little context here, uh, what happens when you look at this passage is it was late fall, and Paul and a crew of 200-something people were on a boat, and a storm came. They found themselves in this terrible storm, that lasted for two weeks. And so we're going to read uh, kind of what happens in the story from Acts chapter 27. Just read a, a section of this, uh, and, and we'll talk about it. And uh, look, since my eyes aren't as, as young as they used to be, I'm going to read from here, but you'll see it up here on the screens behind me. Amen. There we go. Look, I'm not quite at the reader's level, but I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Here's what it says. <laughs> I heard that. It says, when a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship in the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the shattered side of a small island named Cauda, where with great difficulty, we hosted aboard uh, the, uh, the lifeboats being lowered, towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of the Sartis off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. Verse 18, the next day as a gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. They fought the following day, they even took some of, the sh some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until 
at last all hope was gone. Imagine a storm so bad that goes on that you can't see the stars or the sun for days. Okay, I want you to get a picture of what's going on here. They couldn't see the star or sun for days. Verse 21, no one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, stood beside me and he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God, it will be just as he said. Verse 26, but we will be shipwrecked on the island. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, again, 14, not 14 days, 14 nights of storm, as they were being driven across the Sea of Adria, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they drew out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and to the soldiers, check this out. He says, you will die unless the sailors the sailor stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboats and let it drift away. Just as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. He said, you have been worried that you hadn't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God, this is Paul here, before them, and he broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. They might say, Pastor, why do you read this passage? So, so when we look at this passage here, we see Paul and the crew on the ship. They find themselves in the midst of a terrible storm that lasted for two weeks. It was so bad, they didn't see stars, they didn't see sun or anything for all those days. And I have to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a storm or in a season where you just couldn't get your bearings? It, it raged on and you're like, man, I, I can't get a handle of things. I can't find my way to navigate through as I find myself going through this particular storm or this particular season. Sometimes when we experience storms, it's because we're out of God's will for our life, right? For example, we think about Jonah, right? He was running away from God and found himself in the storm, but in this case, Paul wasn't out of God's will for his life, and he still experienced the storm. I say that because some of us might think that the storm that we're facing is because we're out of God's will, and this is not always the case. Like Paul, there are times when something will happen that'll knock our feet from out under us, and we'll lose our bearings. Our presence of mind and our sense of control will fade, and our lives will feel like they're capsizing and falling apart. They found themselves facing an unexpected storm that lasted much longer than they anticipated. Because they couldn't see the sun or the stars, it became impossible for them to navigate this heavy ship. That's why they were throwing things overboard. And after two weeks, almost everyone lost hope except for Paul. Everyone on the boat lost hope except for Paul. And in the midst of the storm, Paul paused and he reassessed his identity and also remembered what God had called him to do and what his assignment was. Again, he paused, reassessed his identity, focused in on what God had called him to do, and maybe right now you've been in that situation or maybe you're going through a similar situation right now. You find yourself in the midst of a storm. You might find yourself in the midst of some adversity. You might find yourself in, in something that you thought this should have been over by now, but it's still going on, 
right? This should have been handled by now. We, we've already prayed, but what, what, is, what is going on? You, fi- you find yourself in that place. And, and, and here's the good news. As we look at the story, Paul found himself in a place with seeming uncertainty, and he took that moment to break bread and give thanks to God. Think about that. He gave thanks to God even though the situation hadn't changed yet. He gave thanks to God even though, if you look at the story, he said, hey, the boat's still going to be shipwrecked. (laughs) But he gave thanks to God in the midst of a storm, and I think there's a lesson for us in that. You might say, well, Pastor, I'm dealing with the storm right now, and you're telling me I should give thanks to God and, 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 and break bread over the communion table? Yes. We break bread over the communion table because what it helps us to do is to remember who we are in Christ and what Jesus has accomplished. That any problem we're dealing with, any storm that we're dealing with, is not greater than the God that we serve. And so when we give thanks to God at the communion table, it's because we're remembering him and that we have ultimate victory in Christ. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. But can I add like a little bonus part to it? (laughs) I'm going to do it anyway, but okay, here we go. The bonus part is what we always read here in 1 Corinthians 11, just a couple verses here. 1 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 23, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. And look at what it says here. It says, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. So in the midst of a storm is when he instituted communion. Things weren't going well is when he instituted communion, right? That that was the night that he did it. He said on the night that he did it, verse 24, he says, and he gave thanks to God for it, similar to what Paul did. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, He took the cup of the wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And we'll stop there. This morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment to pray. I don't know what your storm is. I don't know what your situation is. But let's settle it over the communion table today. You say, but pastor, my boat might still get shipwrecked. It may. But what I know is if you keep reading in Acts, Paul accomplished everything God had for him to accomplish in spite of the storm that he faced. And I believe the same for every one of us. We're going to accomplish all that God's called us to accomplish. And so don't let the storm cause you to lose focus on him and what he's called you to do. So for just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pray for yourself. Pray to God because I recognize when I talk about storms, there's a wide brush that's painted there, right? There could be uh, uh, financial storms. There could be uh, illness, healing type things, stuff in your body, right? There could be relational issues uh, with your family, with your marriages, with whatever, with children, grandchildren. There could be uh, situations on your job. So there's a variety of, of storms. There could be sin storms, stuff that we have caused. But what I know is we have a God who forgives. We have a God who can restore. And what does he ask us to do? To cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And so for a few few moments, right where you are, will you pray for yourself? Pray to God. He loves you. We're settling this over the communion table, and we're not going to pick it up and take it with us. We're going to leave it here with him this morning. And so please, I invite you to pray, and then I'll cover us uh, all in a collective prayer. God, I pray for those under the sound of my voice, God, those in this room, even those watching online, that in spite of what storm they may be facing now, in spite of what challenge that may be be before them, we lift you up and lift your name high because you're the only one worthy to be praised. 
we thank you that you have a solution for every situation that is facing us. And what I pray, God, is just like in that story, as Paul took and broke the bread and gave thanks to you, everyone else around him, their hope was restored. They were able to focus not on the storm, but on what's to come. And I pray we can do the same thing. God, we repent for any sin, thoughts, actions, deeds that go against what you've, what you've called us to do, what we know to be right. But also, God, I pray that if it's healing, if it's, if it's financial, if it's whatever the it may be for us that we're facing, we're giving it over to you and we're trusting you to take care of it. We're trusting you that it is done. That word amen says it is so. So we are trusting that it is so and taken care of in our life because we've given it to you. When it is too big for us to handle, it is a small and a light matter for you, so we trust you with it. And I pray, God, that you will send those who will come alongside us to walk with us, to encourage us as we go on this journey. It's interesting that we see Paul be the one to encourage 240-something people on a boat by continuing to believe in you, God. And I pray that you will send those who will encourage us in this moment that we find ourselves, in this season that we find ourselves, to continue on. We love you and we thank you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And all that agree with that prayer say amen. Amen and amen. At this moment, I'm going to ask you to take your communion elements and take the bread, which represents his body. His body that was broken for us. This represents his body, and I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Can you break it before you eat it to remember that his body was broken? You may eat. In the same way, we're going to take the cup which represents the new covenant in his blood. You may drink. And now I'm just going to ask you to thank God, to give him some praise for what he not only has done, is doing, but will continue to do in each of our lives. Amen? Let us continue in worship.
So hey, y'all. Y'all doing all right? A little chilly? Yeah, okay. Look, it was like 90 degrees for like 10 months, and all of a sudden decided to be fall and winter and all that good stuff. Okay. So we started a brand new series last week. Um, uh, the, the, our fiscal calendar as a church starts in October and runs through September. And so for this month of October, this month of October, what we decided to do was uh, what we're calling a state of the church month. And in this month, what we're going to do is spend time remembering our why, why we exist as a church, why we do the things that God has called us to do. But also, we're going to do some vision casting and look forward to all the things that we're going to do as a church family over the next 12 months. And so we set aside intentionally this month to walk through that process. And so last week, we started this idea of looking back at our why as we look at our core values. We have four core values, or the way I like to frame it is why we exist as a church. And so we looked at the first two last week. We're going to look at the second two this week, and then we're going to take some different steps over the next couple of Sundays. But let's see who's been paying attention. <laughs> so today, if, I, if you need a title for your notes, uh, I'm calling this Why We Exist Part 2. Kind of original, right? <laughs> but Why We Exist Part 2. And uh, I'm going to put up, Audrey, put up our core values for me. Put up the picture. There we go. So these are the four reasons why we exist as a church. And let's see who's been paying attention. Uh, the first reason we exist as a church is to what? Love. love is for loving people. The first reason we exist as a church is for loving people. We talked about this last week. Uh, John 13, 34, 35, Jesus says, uh, the way that people will know that we're his disciples is not because we have a Love Ridge uh, t-shirt on, right? It's not because we have a tattoo or, some, or, or something, you know, a scripture tattoo or have uh, a chain with a cross on it. It's the love we have one for another. And in that scripture where he says that, he says uh, a condition. He says, I'm commanding you to love other people. He says, a new commandment I give you. And he says, to love them in the way that I have loved you. So that's how we're supposed to go love. And that's how, that's how people know we're his followers. And if you say, Pastor, I need more details, go watch the message from last week. Amen. <laughs> The second part of, the second reason we exist as a church is to what? Make disciples. There it is. We exist to make disciples. In the Great Commission in Matthew, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. This is why we do what we do as a church. A matter of fact, this is what every single church should be doing is making disciples. If we're not doing that, then what are we doing? We have to go and make disciples, and we have in been intentional about doing that. Uh, I don't know if I can give a shout-out, but if I could, I've given a shout-out to the Smiths. Uh, we launched our Alpha class this past week, and I heard just great testimonies from that. Um, more to come on that, but just so excited. And we are intentionally focused about making disciples, and we will never stop doing that. Because everything we do has to go back there, and a part of us making disciples is about us loving people. So you see how they all kind of work together. Today we're going to talk about number three. And number three, uh, the reason we exist as a church, which is, this is our little icon, is for strengthening families. So let me hear you say it. Say strengthening families. So I know the first time I asked you, like, what is he going to say? I don't know if I want to say it. I'm still cold. Whatever. Let's try it again. Say strengthening families. There it is. We exist as a church to strengthen families, and some of the problems we see, especially in our country, you can say could be rooted in the fact of the erosion of the family. So many challenges in the family unit that we see, and when we uh, initially prayed about, like, God, what are going to be the things that we are, should be focused on, this was one of the things that God highlighted for us. That, that we should be a part of uh, that proverbial village, if you will, that helps to make a difference in families, in our community. That's a part of what he's called us to. But let me show you some scripture here. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 8 here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. So 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verses 1 through 8. I'll give you a second to get there. And I'm going to be reading it from the New Living Translation. Please feel free to read it from whatever translation you have in front of me. We'll get to the same place, even though mine will be better. Just kidding. Just 
I always wanted to say that. <laughs> First Timothy 5, verse 1, it says this. He says, never speak harshly to an older man, uh, but appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. Talk to a younger man as you would to your own brothers. Treat older women as you would your mother. And treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children, uh, but if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness uh, at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something uh, that pleases God. Verse five. Now a true widow, a woman who is truly alone in this world, has and has placed her hope in God. She prays night and day, asking God for help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead even while she lives. Give these instructions to your church so that no one uh, will be open to criticism. But those who won't, who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their old household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. What I want you to see from this one passage, and we're going to look at another one, is the fact that there is a responsibility for us to care for people. There's a responsibility for us to care for people. And we can't say, I mean, you know, we can't say, hey, we love people, but when God, when we see an opportunity and God gives us the opportunity and gives us everything we need to help people, we turn the other way. We have to strengthen families and we have to help people because we're called to. Amen. Look, I don't like how y'all looking at me like, whatever, Pastor. <laughs> This is what we have to do. We have to support and walk with people. Let's go to another passage. Uh, go to the book of James, not too far from there. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Let me show you one more. James chapter 1. I'm going to uh, read verse 27 in James chapter 1, starting in 27, and we'll go over into chapter 2. That's like the last verse of chapter 1. So James chapter 1, verse 27 New Living Translation, and I realize some of y'all aren't turning, you're just pushing buttons, amen. <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 27, look at what it says here. He says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father uh, means caring for orphans and widows in their distresses and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now, now keep in mind, we're going to go to chapter 2, but keep in mind when he wrote this, it was just like one letter, right? So we, we're going to continue because he's continuing with the same thought here. He says in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, look at what he says. How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? It's like, well, what do you mean, James? He's going to tell us. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting. This is a meeting. Hey, meeting. He says, if someone comes to your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another one comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes, if you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom, God, a kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Verse 8, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey uh, the royal law as found in scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law. What law? The law of love. Verse 10, he says, for, if, for the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who's broken all of God's laws. Ouch. <laughs> he says, for the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you've still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. And the church said amen. amen. <laughs> when you look at this passage, it speaks to who we are as a church and how we interact with other people. 
th these are like character things that he's talking about here. Th this speaks to our heart. And so to me, we can't just take pictures and say, man, we do all this good in the community, but when people come, we treat them funny. Or we can't just go serve with the church, and then when we get to uh, uh, Publix, treat people funny. This has to be who we are. We have to love people. And as we're called to serve and to strengthen families, uh, uh, we have to take this really, really seriously. <sighs> when I understood this assignment for us to strengthen families, I realized there are many uh, unique and creative ways to do life and to support one another. And this can't be limited only to financial support. Because there are some problems within our families, within our lives, that money can't solve. Having all the money in the world but not having love or having parents to guide you isn't going to solve the problem, right? Not having peace but having all the money in the world is not going to solve that problem. You, you understand. And so what we recognize is a part of this call is for us to do life with the people that God has called us to do life with. And, and simply stated, this is how I phrase it, we must be willing to allow God to connect us to others and to do life with them. We have to be willing to allow God to connect us with other people and to be willing to do life with them. And, and, and here's the thing, look, look how it all works together. Uh, if we're loving on people and have a goal to be uh, disciple makers, and I always talk about this, this idea that we should be disciple makers, not just disciples ourselves, we need to go and make disciples, right? Then who better to come alongside someone and walk with them, right? Who better to be put in position to walk with someone else than us? Because here's the thing. It's almost like someone who goes to, um, you know, they got like the EMS, the people who are with the ambulances or whatever. So it's like you go through all this training, and so now I know how to save lives. And when the 911 call comes in, I'm like, well, I'm not going to help them. Like, it's like, well, wait, you've been equipped to go and help them, right? You, you've been trained to go and help them. And in so many ways, he's training us to be a disciple to go out there and help them. And we have to recognize that that is a part of the call. That is a part of who we have to be, and we can't run from it. While I say that, let me also say in the same breath that you also have to understand that going out to serve other people also means you have to allow someone to serve you. We have to be, uh, if I could paint, a, a, I'm a visual person. So it's almost like we walk around with a cup and a pitcher in our hand. We have a pitcher because we get to pour into other people. But we have a cup because someone needs to pour into us. And if all we walk around with is a pitcher and never allow someone to pour into us, we are deceiving ourselves because there's a deficiency going on there. Real community, and you hear me say this all the time, is us having a culture of authenticity and a culture of care and concern for one another. Not something fake, not perfected phoniness. You know, I, I, I say this jokingly, but it is true. <laughs> uh, we were, um, Cindy and I talk about when we first got married, we married, what, 17 years now. But when we first got married, like, them first two years was just like, you know, WWE or it was great, right? It was just, you know, the good and the bad. And I remember we used to sometimes argue over something stupid, right? Well, I guess a lot of times argue over something stupid. But we would argue, literally be arguing back and forth all the way to church. Get out the car, hit the church parking lot. Hey, praise the Lord, y'all. Amen. All right now. How y'all doing? All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Be mad. Be, be upset with one another, but just, you know, put on the smile. Because what we knew then or what we were taught was this idea of being phony. Not learning to really deal with our stuff or being okay with saying, hey, I'm not okay. And so to me, when we talk about the culture that we have to have here and the culture of who we have to be to really get healed and to really go and do what God has called us to do is we can't have that. We have to find safe places and create a safe space for us to say, hey, I am struggling right now. Or I am hurting right now. And that's the point of community so we can do life together and support one another. 
when I use that imagery earlier of Paul in that shipwreck with Max 27, the thing I think about with that is, is if, I, if, if someone comes alongside and you're about to have a shipwreck, I can't stop the ship from wrecking. <laughs> you get that? I, I can't stop the ship from wrecking, but the fact that I can still walk with you afterwards and I guess help pick up the pieces, <laughs> quite literally, <laughs> there's something to that versus going through it alone. And we can't miss the value in community or the richness that comes from us being connected to the place where God has called us to be. Amen? So that's about strengthening families. We have to go and strengthen families. We have to go, and as you see uh, uh, situations, is, is every situation going to be a situation? Maybe not. But we have to be willing to go and try. Does this bear fruit? Am I equipped to help? Versus turning a blind eye. Amen? So that was number three, strengthening families. Number four, the fourth reason we exist is for collaborating with others. Let me hear you say that. Say collaborating Collaborating. with others. Say straight again. Say collaborating Collaborating. with others. We are called to work with other folks. This is my logo. (laughs) We are called to be on assignment with other people. Do you know that our church is not in competition with any other church? God is using all of us to complete the mission. We don't compete with them. Like, how foolish would that be for us to compete when we're on the same team? When we have the same goal? It, it'd almost be like if there was a branch of the Army, I think like Fort Bragg is a branch in Columbus, and there's another branch, there's not Fort Bragg, Fort Benning, and then there's like Fort Bragg or something in North Carolina, and they're, they're in competition with each other. They don't like each other. We say, y'all in the same Army, what's the matter with you, right? How are you fighting against each other when you're supposed to be fighting a common enemy? But do we do that as Christians? No. Let, let's, let's go to Scripture, and then I, I, I'll talk a little more. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. So I say this all the time. This is like one of my favorite passages, I promise. It really is. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So go to Ephesians. If you're in Galatians, it's next door. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. If you're in Philippians, you went too far. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. New Living Translation again. Uh, For me, please follow along with whatever translation you have. It says this. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor, and the teacher. We refer to these as the five-fold ministry gifts. And what are they supposed to do? Here it's going to tell you. It says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So let's break this down, because some, some translations might say to perfect, to mature. So the fivefold ministry is to help equip God's people to go and do the work. When I was a kid growing up in church, I thought the pastor, we used to say pastor, but the pastor, the missionary, and all of them, they did this work, not us. I thought I was supposed to just, you know, live right, whatever that meant. Not, you know, smoke, drink, or chew, or run around with those who do. You know, those things they tell you as a kid. Not have sex with somebody you're not married to. All that stuff. That's all I knew. But I didn't understand until one day I read the Bible for myself that, wait, there's something for me to do as a follower of Christ? I just wanted to get saved, so I didn't go to hell. The work is to equip the saints, which means everyone who's named Jesus, and we go do the work. Can y'all say we? That means me. Oh, yeah, say, that means me. They didn't say that part, Daryl. They were like, we, but you? Because I got to go and, you know, game's coming on. Okay. So this is verse 13. He says, so how long will they do? They said, they will continue, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and our knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching We will not be influenced with people who try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. But look at what it says in 15 and 16, and this is where I really want you to focus in on. He said, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, his church. So again, he's going to start and set up this imagery where Christ is the head and we are the body, right? Uh, I'm showing my age. We come together like Voltron or come together like the Power Rangers or whatever it is. We form one group. And, 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 and he's the head and we're the body that does the work. And look at what it says in 16. It says, he, talking about Jesus, 
makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What does that mean? Every single one of us has what I like to call to or refer to as a superpower. <laughs> we have gifts. We have talents. We have abilities that God put in us to be used. And so when you hear me say on most Sundays about us joining this church and bringing our gifts and talents, this is what I'm talking about here. It says, as each part does its own special work. Again, think quite literally of our body. If my circulatory system said, man, I don't want to use my gifts, it would be a problem. <laughs> if my hands and my feet, if my eyes and my ears decided they didn't want to do their work, we would go nowhere. Quite literally, if my feet said we're not moving, I'd be sitting still, right? In the same way, we aren't going to go to where we need to go as a church if we don't do our own special work, the part that God has called us to do. And so if God's called you here, he's giving you something to do here. A amen. When we look at this, we have to recognize that you trying to do it on your own is limited. Me, as pastor trying to do it on my own, is limited. There's only one me. I mean, could you imagine me? You see the people with, like, the, uh, the little mannequins next to them on the wires. I'm playing the guitar. I'm trying to sing and do all the dancing like that. That would be crazy, right? Like, I'm greeting at the door, and then I'm running over here to sit and preach at the same time. Like, like what, what are we doing? It takes all of us doing our part. And so when I talk about collaborations, there's kind of three different collaborations that you have to think about. One is what I'll call the in-house collaboration. I said in-house collaboration. Yeah, here at this church, in-house, we need to be using our gifts and find the place where God has called us to serve. Those are in-house collaborations. What, what, what is the thing that God has called us to do? We're going to do that part in here. The second collaboration is what I call an outward collaboration. Outward collaborations is what we do outside of this church. Now, there's two parts of that. As a church, we will partner with other organizations that are doing what we call kingdom work, whether they believe in Jesus or not. You say, what? Yes. Why? Because like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, we become all things to all men to try to win some. And so if there's an organization that doesn't believe, but they just say, hey, we go and clean up the neighborhood and, and try to help people, then we're going to partner with them because they're doing kingdom work with the hopes that us being who we are as followers of Christ, get, get an opportunity to share our Jesus story with them. But we won't say, well, I don't know if they believe in Jesus. Can we partner with them? Why can't we if they're doing kingdom work? We're going to collaborate with them. Why? Because we're supposed to be advancing the kingdom. And if they're in our community doing kingdom work, we can't be focused with whether or not our name is on something. I grew up in an area in Decatur where there were four different churches in our community. Uh, there was like a Methodist church, probably more than that. But there was like Methodist church, Baptist church, uh, Kojic church, uh, Presbyterian church. There was all these churches, right? And everybody had a, a food pantry and like a clothes closet, you know, where you can get food and get stuff if you needed it. And everybody did a terrible job at it. They really did. It was bad. And you know why? Because everybody had to have their name on it. Versus saying, hey, why don't we pool our resources if we're serving the same community? If we, if, if, let's pool our resources and create something that we can staff and we can get resources to really help people versus uh, having our name on something. And what I think about and what I wonder and what I hope we never get to is a place that we're more focused on branding than really serving and having a kingdom mindset. If we're called to go and help, we will collaborate with people because we're more, more interested in advancing the kingdom of God than we are advancing the Love Bridge Church brand. Now, hear me say, we want to grow. We want to be big. We want to do all those things, but not at sacrificing the kingdom because that's what we're called to be a part of. So when you hear me talk about collaborating with others, that is what that needs to look like. 
us collaborating with other people outside of here. And so I said, that's one side as a church, but that also applies to you. The only impact we, should ha we have with people can't just be when you're serving at church. A amen. <laughs> the question you ask yourself here is, is someone impacted by you being a follower of Christ? Is someone else being impacted by the fact that you're a follower of Christ? That has to be something we ask ourselves, and it can't only happen when we serve in church. You say, why? Because there's somebody who lives next door to you. There's somebody who lives in your neighborhood who doesn't know them. And I may never meet them, but you will. When we think about the work that we're doing, we have to recognize that our work is a part of a larger connected work that God is doing in the lives of others, this community, this country, and in this world. And we have to do our part. I said there were three collaborations. I'm going to give you that very last one. I said there was an in-house collaboration, an outward collaboration, and the last one is what I'll call an upward collaboration. You said upward collaboration. So we had an in-house thing. We had an outward. What's the upward? Well, the upward part is making sure that we're connecting with God to do the thing that he's called us to do. Because ultimately, it's not our agenda. It is his. And so although something may look good on paper, we always connect with God through prayer and everything else to make sure that we're in line with what he's called us to do. And so today, those are our two things. Our, our, our four reasons we exist as we, as we conclude are for loving people, for making disciples, for strengthening families, and we're called for collaborating with other people. This is our why. This is why we exist as a church. And if you look at all the events and all the things we do, ultimately they're weaving back into those things. They, they find their way back there. And you say, well, why is it so important for us to make sure we know? Because we don't want to get so far down the road that we don't look back and make sure that we're aligned with what we say that we're called to do. And so we take the time once a year at least to, to realign ourselves and say, hey, are we doing things that are going to be um, in step with what we say that we're about and the reason God's called us to come together as a community of faith? Amen? With that being said, I only have a couple questions left. One is, if you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, uh, now's a great time to get saved. Here's what we believe. We believe that Jesus really did live. He walked this earth and died on the cross for our sins. He was buried for three days. He rose again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And by us placing our faith in him, that's what gives us access to go to heaven. It's not all the goody-goody things that we do. We're not saved by our good works. We're, in fact, saved to go and do good works. And so a part of all that we're talking about here starts with making the decision to place our faith in him. And so you have to ask yourself, if you were to die in the next few moments, can you say with confidence that I know I would be in heaven? When I ask this question, it's not about church, it's not about religion. It's like, listen, you need to secure your future first and foremost. Every single person that is listening to me in this room, you watching online, is going to die one day. And you need to make this decision before you die. And so if you make this decision, if you hadn't made it, but if you make it today, I will see you again. But if you don't make this, if you make that decision, I will see you again, even if I don't see you again here on earth. And so please, man, please, sir, don't leave this place, don't leave this time without getting saved. It is that serious, it is that important a thing for us to do. In a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing, we'll have prayer counselors come down. If you need to make that decision, please, 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 don't leave today without making that decision and securing your future. And the beauty of it is, um, it is really the starting point. It secures who we are, but then there are so many other assignments and tasks that God has for you to do while you're living on this earth. But you can't do it without him. So please get saved today. The second point is this. If you're here and you say, well, Pastor, I made that decision to get saved. Uh, but if I'm honest, I'm not living the life that I should be living. Well, there's good news. God's not mad at you. God loves you with a never-failing, undying love. God knows uh, uh, all the poor decisions. God knows uh, uh, maybe the loss. Maybe there's been trauma. Maybe there's been hurt. Maybe there's reasons where you say, you know, I got church hurt, and I just, I just can't deal with church people. And you've left, and you've gone away. But here's the thing. God loves you and says, listen, come on back. 
He says, repent and let's get up and keep going. Jesus didn't die for you to spend your life stuck. For you to spend your life feeling like, ah, nothing's working. No. If you feel like you're in a fog or in that storm that's been going on longer than you feel like it should, he is your only hope. So don't give up on him. He hadn't given up on you. And so if you say, man, I, I love to kind of maybe rededicate, recommit myself to the things of God. We love to pray that prayer with you. And so if that is you, um, in a moment when we come and, and sing and the prayer councils come down, you can pray a prayer of rededication and rededicate and recommit yourself to the things of God. Because I believe what he's called you to do, he has still called you to do. Third is prayer. If you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too small, there's nothing too large. We count it a privilege to be able to pray with you. And last and certainly not, not least, if God's called you to be a part of this church, um, look, I guess you know what we're about now, huh? <laughs> but we are a church that one of the things we strive to do is to teach the word of God in a simple, in an uncomplicated way so you can understand it and go live it. Second, we get busy in our community because we believe that's what the Bible tells us to do. And third, as you heard me say, we are a church made of people from different backgrounds, different gifts, uh, different ages from different walks of life. And we feel like God's brought us here together and so we're bringing our gifts and talents together to serve God and to serve this community. And so if you say, man, I'd love to be a part of that, we would love to have you. So four things. If you need to get saved, if you need to rededicate, if you need prayer, or if God's called you to be a part of this church, we would love to have you. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you can stand, can you stand for a moment right where you are? I'm going to ask my prayer counselors to come and get in position. And while they are singing and the prayer counselors are down, I'm going to ask you, if you need to respond to one of those four things, please do it, and we're going to sing with these fine folks behind me. Amen.